All right. Waiting for multi-stage designs. Um, you know, I said earlier, you just got to keep track of the stages and build them up. In um, area probability samples like HRS and, and family growth, this is always the case that you've got multiple stages. So you, um, you know, the same steps we talked about apply before. Now, quality control, yeah, last slide, and then we'll stop for a minute. Um, quality control is just critical. I mean, the, the um, you know, it's, it's sort of, uh, in a way, the least interesting part of what you do, but you got to do it right. And you need to set up procedures that are general, that you follow on every survey, especially if you're a place like SRO, where you're doing a lot of these things. You know, you need to have it be routine, where you've got basically a checklist that you go through, and you, you go through every step on your checklist. Compute the base weights. You check that they add up to the right things. You do an on-response adjustment. You need to check the sum of those weights. The, the sum of the weights coming into a step need to equal the sum of the weights going out of a step once you account for all the parts of the file. You know, the, the eligibles, the ineligibles, respondents, and non-respondents. You got to make that sort of accounting uh, check to be sure that you haven't fouled something up. Um, you ought to review the distribution of the weights at every stage. You know, to make sure you haven't inadvertently really created some uh, ones that are, you know, just stick out like a sore thumb. And, you know, it's, you may think you've done logical things at every step, and yet you end up with uh, some handful that are really different from uh, the other weights. So, you, you know, you got to look at those and then go back and make sure that you feel like you've done the right thing. You know, you're trying to correct bias due to non-response, and you're trying to reflect the design of your sample to start with. So, you know, if you're confident you need some really extreme adjustments to correct for non-response bias, then you let it go. Um, like if you, you know, if you've got among African Americans a 20% response rate, but you got a 50% response rate for everybody else, you're just going to naturally have different size weights. And, you know, that's probably fine. You know, assuming African Americans <coughs> respond differently on your analysis variable, you, you want that, uh, those differences in weight. <coughs> All right. Um, you have one question from the chat. All right. <clears throat> Can you run the same kind of balance checks if you use a classification algorithm for modeling non-response? It's harder because you'll have these really complex interactions in your implied model. It's like a, you know, it's not a neat model that you can write down in one formula is, is what happens. Like, uh, well, let me get back up here. If you had in this model, you know, suppose I, it's easy to put in an interaction of uh, race and education in this sort of model. If you do a uh, classification algorithm, uh, it may find that, you know, it, it doesn't care about the interaction of being white and having a less than high school education. You know, it just leaves out that combination entirely as being important. But the other it, partial interactions are important. But it's hard to specify that in this kind of neat formula and then do your balance check. So, um, Yeah, I guess the answer to this balance uh, question is um, no. Because <laughs> when you get down to that last 
set of cells in the uh, tree. Um, you know, the, the algorithm is telling you, here, I'm at the point where the response probability is estimated to be the same for respondents and non-respondents. So it's balanced. The algorithm does it for you. There are, let me say one more thing. There are uh, like random forests. That one is different in the sense that you, you fit a whole bunch of regression trees and you kind of average them together and you get predicted response propensities for each case. Um, you don't get cells, in other words. The, uh, get these importance values out of a, a random forest. So it, you know, it might tell you that, um, all right, education is the most important thing after I've sorted through all these regression trees. And then it'll rank them higher, hierarchically. I guess you can fit a model with those things as main effects and then look at the size of the standardized coefficients and see if they sort out the way that that Forest tells you, but it, it's you know it's it's not straightforward at all. Oh, question. good question. Mm -hmm. What else can you do to check the quality of the non-response adjustment algorithm? In other words, how should we be scrutinizing the output? Yeah, the, uh, split the sample. You know, like cross-validation. If you got a great big sample, you, know, you got a holdout sample, and you got a sample that you use your algorithm on, fit the model on that sample, and then use it to predict the responses or non-responses in the holdout sample and see how you do. In a sense, random forest does that internally for you. So that that's the nice thing about random forest. It, it's sort of, um, you know, fortified against this model, this specification. So it, it, it it's probably better than the the regular CART algorithm for for this particular application. Uh, so going back to quality control, say that like you have, I don't know, a, a few. Non-response adjustments that you are like uh, trying or testing. Um, so you, you would expect uh, when you one of, I think one of your suggestions in your slide there was to look at the weighted estimates, right? Uh, you would expect that like if you have like uh, say successful non-response adjustments for the point estimates to change a little bit, right? Like because if they don't change, then why you are making that non-response adjustment to begin with, right? Yeah, the um, um, you know it's unless you got some external validation data, it's hard to tell if you're changing in the right direction. It, it's um, you can check the distribution of your covariates after the weight adjustment and see if that matches external uh, sources. But if you know if you're you're doing the survey to estimate some brand new thing. You don't know much about the thing. So it, it's, um, yeah, it's very, it's like, you know, the basic question is, how do you check bias? And, uh, you know, that's hard without external data. If you're doing, I guess, if you're doing a longitudinal survey and you kind of trust what you've done in the past, you can see if you really <coughs> forked around your estimates of analysis variables compared to the last wave. And if you have, then you begin to wonder about whether uh, you made a error. Okay, um, let's take five. Back at 11.25 or so. 
Okay. Weak calibration. I see I'm, I'm halfway done with the slides and I'm more than halfway done with the time, so we should uh, step it up, I guess. Um, weight calibration is um, a really important step, I think, in most surveys. Uh, Sophie earlier asked, well, what's the most important thing? Base weights? Do those things really matter after you go through these other steps? And the, the answer is they tend to get less important, you know, as you do the non-response adjustment and you kind of, you do this weight calibration. Um, a lot of times you'd find if you just ignored the base weights and you went through the same two steps, your weights will not necessarily end up in a much different place. But, um, you know, the, the steps that I've given you are sort of the industry standard, so we always go through them. The uh, idea behind calibration is you're using auxiliaries, you know, covariates again, that um, you've got available, not necessarily, well, you, you've got them available on your responding sample. You don't need, necessarily need the individual values for your non-respondents, though. That's a nice thing about this uh, technique. And what it does, it, it's got a twofold uh, purpose. It's kind of like you're fitting a model to your Ys. So the better your covariates are as predictors of the Y variables, the more you can reduce variances. So that's good. But a critical thing in a lot of surveys is you correct uh, what are called coverage errors. And um, I've got a, let me skip down here. I've got a picture that I sort of like down in the non probability sample section that um, looks like this. You know, without going through this, I'll get to that later, but suppose you've got, you know, you draw a sample, that's this green thing here, but you've got coverage problems in the sense that there's a piece of your universe, this big blue ellipse, that your sample either doesn't cover at all or it covers poorly. So. An example of that in household surveys in the U.S. is that if you go out and you do a um, demographic survey, you take your base weights, you can non-response adjustment, um, you sum those things up, you will estimate only about 80% of the total population of young African-American males, um, young Hispanic males, and there are other groups that you just, your sample doesn't weight up to what you feel is the correct population count. You know, you're short. That's referred to as coverage error. And it, it happens to everybody. It happens in Michigan surveys, it happens in the Census Bureau surveys, it happens in, uh, I believe even the American Community Survey at the Census Bureau, which is probably as, you know, as high quality as household survey as there is in the U.S., it happens to some extent there. And, the, you know, the reasons are, are hard to explain, but the fact that they occur mean that we want to do something to bring the weights up to a level that we think is, is better. You know, so we weight up to the whole population. Now, how do we do that? The, the kind of the simplest way is post stratification. So <clears throat> what you do is you, you take your, your responding sample, put it into some groups. You know, age groups, regions, types of business, types of school, if you're doing a school survey, and you adjust the weights, so, so the estimated counts of units equal the population counts. They're also called control counts. 
So the, these would be external census counts or frame counts. So the, the post stratified estimator looks like this. Um, this gamma up to cap G is the number of post strata. And then P e hat Y gamma is the estimated total of whatever your analysis variable is based on the input weights. You know, like non response adjusted base weight. N <coughs> hat in gamma is just the sum of those weights, which is an estimate of the count of people in there. So th this ratio is an estimate of the mean in that post straight. Cap in sub gamma is your external pop count. So you're, you're essentially saying, I can do a decent job of estimating the mean in my sample, but to get the right level for a total, I blow that up by this external census count. So that, that's the whole idea. And the, you know, the, Post strata, strata can be complicated. There can be crosses of variables. There can be a whole bunch of the things. Um, you know, you don't have to limit yourself to five or ten. You could have a hundred if your sample supports that many. And, and um, the thing that's nice is you do get a weight out. So the, the implied final weight is this. It's the input weight. DI is like the non response adjusted base weight for unit I. And then this cap in over in hat is called a post stratification ratio or adjustment. So if I've got under coverage, this input weighted estimate of the count is going to be too small. So this ratio is going to be bigger than one. So, you know, if I've got 80% coverage, this is like 1.2 or thereabouts. So th this is what is the coverage adjustment. You know, if this number is bigger than one, you know, that's basically what's happening. If it sort of hovers around one, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more, that means you don't have a coverage problem. You're, you're hoping you're reducing variances by this step. So, um, in the surveys you work on, does this post stratification used? HRS uses it for sure. What do you guys in the back work on? I actually, um, I work on the administrative side of the university, and um, we had um, a representative sample of the university population, of faculty, staff, and students, and we had a waiting frame for them, and um, Colleagues here at ISR created the sampling frame and um, created the weights in the post stratification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you're if you're sampling from an administrative frame, you may not have this kind of issue, the coverage issue. Yeah. So it you know varies depends on your application whether the whether you're trying to correct coverage problems or reduce variances. It, it's sort of a cosmetic thing too. <coughs> You know, if you, you do this adjustment and you sum the weights up, you fix them so that the sum of the weights within a post stratum is exactly equal to your external census count. So, you, you know, you got this external validity and appearance that you can fall back on. Uh, Rick, yeah. you, you mentioned you should adjust for coverage, right? But like, um, if you don't have also uh, data from uh, non respondents, this this can also be a, an adjustment for non response. Uh, it, yeah, you, you can. Uh, Raphael's comment was it, this can act as a non response adjustment at the same time <coughs> as coverage adjustment, or it could just be the non response adjustment. So you get both. There's an implied model behind this thing that's important to think about. Um, for the analysis variables, you're saying that the mean within a cell is common for every unit in the population. So um, that, if that's true, then you get variance reduction. If, 
it's not true. I mean, if you don't create very many post strata and you got a pretty complicated population, you would, would expect this not to be true. So if that's the case, you probably won't get much variance re your reduction. So the, <coughs> yeah, there's, how do you form the post strata? The two things to think about are modeling the Ys and what's the response structure? And that'll help guide you in picking a uh, post strata. All right, so here, here's an example. Um, this is which population? Health interview survey again. So I've got, this is in my whole little population that's in this PRAC tools package. I categorize uh, the population by hispanicity and age group. And then the percentages that are in here are the percentage of people who say that they receive Medicaid, you know, medical assistance for, for poor people. So what you see is, um, you know, the, here's Hispanics, non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic blacks, plus everybody else. Uh, whites uniformly have a lower rate of receiving Medicaid, but there's an age effect also. Um, percentage is higher for under 18, it goes down in the working years, and then it goes back up a bit in the retirement years. Um, the, you know, these are people who are eligible for Medicare, but in the US at least, but they also can get uh, Medicaid their income's real low, so that, you know, it goes back up. But also the, um, there's kind of an interaction effect here if you look at it, you know, age co combined with hispanicity may be important. So my little example is I create, uh, what have I got, one, two, three, six, uh, or five times three, 15 post strength. And, um, Here's how you do it in R. This uh, X tabs function is just a way to do the cross tab. So you, you can put a formula in. So this is, there's a variable called age dot group, which is some recode, I think. Hispanic dot R, uh, you specify the data set. This is a bigger one, it's like 20,000 cases, bigger than that first one I showed you. Um, you know, I select a simple random sample just for illustration of size 250, you know, track that data. And then um, this uses the survey package. So wh what you do in the survey package is you, you in all these packages that will analyze survey data, you've got to tell the software what are the strata, what are the clusters, and what are the weights? You know, those are the three key things. There may be some other things that you can give it. But the, the way you do it in our survey is you call this function called SBY design. So you tell it uh, what are the clusters. So it, its parameter name is, is IDs. And tilde zero means no clusters. Straight up means what you think, and then you give it the variable that specifies straight up, which there are none here. Now, why you say not here until the zero there is a mystery to me. You know, it's how surveys program. This FPC is, uh, you know, it, it comes in in variances, so let's not worry about that. You tell it what your sample data is, and then you tell it the variable that specifies the weights. So it, it, you also have to use a tilde there. And then there's a function that says post stratify. So you feed it this design object. So what, what I've done here basically is specify that I've got a simple random sample. That's all this amounts to, this code. And post stratify takes that design object in HIS.BSG, and you know, that's what I called it here. And um, 
you tell with the post straight. So I've got age group plus Hispanic in a formula, and that you know that leads to the cross of those two variables being post straight. And then you tell it the pop counts, which is in dot ps that I defined on the previous slide. You know, it, it's critical that um, you get the, this formula be exactly the same as the formula up here for my pop counts. Because it's got a, you know, if you get a mismatch on that, I mean, it's going to associate the pop count for post stratum one with incorrectly with post stratum 10 or something. So you, you've got to make sure that those are uh, specified in the right order. So, I, in other words, if I had specified this as Hispanic R plus age group. And then over in post straight, I, I go uh, age group plus Hispanic R. Everything would be wrong. So you, you got to get that coordinated. And then it goes away and it, you know, it computes weights for you. Um, if you want to see the weights, which is a good idea, you can recover those with this function that's called weights. So I saved my post straight output in ps.psgn. I apply this weights extractor function, and that'll give me every uh, the weight for every case in the file. <clears throat> now, you ought to check to be sure that um, it's right. And the way to check it is if I estimate the pop count. In each post stratum, I should get my control count, right? Because that's what post stratification forces. And then I also ought to get a standard error of zero on those estimated counts. Because I'm, you know, think of it this way I'm forcing every sample to have the same sum of the weights in those post strata because I'm making this external control adjustment. So the uh, function is SVY total. They'll give you estimated totals. You, this is a, gives me the interaction of age group and Hispanic. And then you feed it that post stratified design object. So here are my totals, which are the pop totals. Standard errors of zero. So that's all good. You know, it's a little quality control check. So, uh, Rick, it's not going to happen because you're using in R the post straight as sign, right? Because if you are using other software or like if you don't use that post straight as sign, only use the post straight by weights uh, with, uh, I don't know, some sort of like rec standard survey design <laughs> objects, those standard errors are going to be different from zero. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, you know, in case you didn't hear all that, if Suppose I got some public use file, and I know the thing's post stratified, but I just, you know, I specify the survey design in a way that doesn't tell the software that it's post stratified. I'll, I will get non-zero standard errors here. So the way to, you know, you'll get bigger ones. You ought to be getting zero. The same thing can happen for analysis variables. You, you probably, you may estimate standard errors that are bigger than the real post-stratified standard errors. Because it's like you're not giving yourself credit for post-stratifying. So here's the way around that. Um, if you can figure out how the post-stratification is done, at least, you know, approximately, it, it may be hard based on the survey documentation. You can repost stratify yourself. You know, you, you can sum up the weights and what you think are the post strata, use those for control counts, go through, repost stratify the whole thing in R in this case, and then tell our survey that you got a post stratified design. 
And then you'll get credit for doing the post stratification in your standard errors. Sounds kludgy, but you know, it's I think it's better than ignoring the fact that um, you know this this is often the case in public use files. Unless they give you replication weights, which I'm not talking about here, but you know, weights where you can do jackknife variances or balanced hash sample variances or bootstrap variances, and they recompute those weights for every one of those replicate subsamples, that will reflect all these machinations like post stratification and, and uh, you know more complicated things. Then you're okay, which is a good argument for giving your users uh, <coughs> replication weights. Great question from the chat. I'd like to hear um, Rick's thoughts about trimming weights produced by post stratification or raking. What should guide decisions on whether or how to trim? <clears throat> no, it's you know it's arbitrary. The people do it for sure. I mean the idea is you get extreme weights that uh, you just don't like the looks of. And um, is there something you can do for your survey to convince yourself you're doing the right thing? It's, um, you know, it's a trade-off between are those weights needed to correct bias versus uh, are those weights so wild that they increase mean square errors? And um, I don't really know what the right answer is. You know, people do things like uh, um, trim the largest weights back so that they're no bigger than the 95th percentile of the weight distribution. And there's, or six times the median weight. You know, you'll see all sorts of stuff. And they do it routinely. And there's no way to prove that it's good or bad based on your one survey. There are simulation studies that have been done that you can look up on this. Um, there's, uh, I don't think there's any nice clean answer. You know, to me, the, the um, best work on this is some stuff that uh, Ray Chambers did years ago on. Um, this publication in JASA on uh, uberized kind of estimators, but you, you know, you got to consider both the whys and the weights for those things. It's pretty messy. So that, that's my non-answer on that. <laughs> Any other questions I can't answer? <laughs> This is like in a, one of these uh, politicians' press conferences where you ask them a question, they and you they throw up the smoke screen. They change the subject. All right. Um, so this slide is just illustrating that we gained a little bit by post stratifying. These are estimates of the total number of people getting Medicaid. So on, on that table, a few slides back, we saw there's an, a. Uh, relationship between being Hispanic and your age and getting Medicaid. So you'd hope that you reduce standard errors. And here are the standard errors on the estimated counts. Uh, the simple random sample standard error is about 385, post stratified 344. So, you know, we got better. If you look at the coefficient of variation, it goes from 0.20 to 0.18. It, it's, this is sort of typical, you know, we got a gain, it's not overwhelming. Uh, it's uh, like 10%, 15%, that, that's sort of reduction. You'll see even in more complicated cases. But still, you know, you wanna do the best you can. So if you ignored the post stratification in a uh, public use file, you'd be estimating standard errors in the second line that are too big. Okay, raking. Um, 
another highly popular technique. The um, thing that, that you often run into is you got a bunch of variables that you'd like to calibrate to, but your sample gets thin once you cross them all. You know, suppose that we think that in our analysis variables, age, sex, race, ethnicity are good predictors of whatever we're measuring, income or receipt of Medicaid or something like that. Um, but if we do a three-way table of those, the sample gets really small in some cells. So the thing that people tend to fall back to then is raking. So what, what that means is you just adjust the weights so that the sum for the age groups match the control totals, the sum for sex matches the control totals, and so on. But the crosses don't match external control totals. You, know, you, you just control to the margins. And the, the implied model for an analysis variable is main effects only, is what that amounts to. No interactions. And, um, you know, in principle, to decide between post-stratification where you fully cross a bunch of stuff versus raking where you only use the margins, you ought to do some modeling of your analysis variables and just see what comes out. Are interactions significant? If they are, you know, you ought to try to incorporate those. And one thing you can do uh, in raking is, it doesn't have to be just the standalone variables here. I could rake to age group on one margin and then sex crossed with race ethnicity on another. You know, I could tr create a raking dimension that's actually the, the interaction of some variables. So it, it's more flexible than it, it looks like at, at first. And, and a lot of people will do that. And how do you decide what interaction to use? You should do some modeling of the whys. Um, you know, if you're leaning on this raking to correct for undercoverage, then you ought to, you know, look at your counts, weighted counts with your input weights, compare those to census counts in various cross tabs and see where you're short to help decide also. Okay, here's a raking example. It basically works like uh, um, the post-stratification example. Well, one thing that you gotta be careful of is, uh, you know, this is like a contingency table. The way the raking algorithm works, you kinda, you leave out the one of the categories of your raking margins, otherwise it won't work. You know, it's like, Fitting a model with categorical covariates, one way to do it is you leave out the, the highest or the lowest category in, you know, if you got six education levels, you leave one of them out in your regression spec um, so that the algorithm will give you a solution. And the, you know, the nice pieces of software will do it for you when you run a regression. In this raking, you, you've got, when you call uh, this calibrate function to do raking, it'll interpret this as dot factor stuff correctly. But the thing that you got to do on your own is leave out one level when you feed it pop counts. All right, so I'm not going to go to R to do that, considering time. Now, um, there's this thing called general regression estimation that in, in principle is, is uh, you know, better and more general than either raking or post-stratification, because you can use both continuous and categorical covariates in it. You know, that, that's the, the advantage of it. Um, and I wrote this formula down, which looks complicated, but you know, if you piece it out, it's not so bad. 
what a Greg estimator ends up looking like is you got an estimate based on your input weights. And then you've got a correction factor here that depends on the regression of Y on your covariance X. That's what this B hat is, the slope of that regression. And then I've got the pop counts, the census counts for the covariance minus the estimates from my input weights in the covariance. So if, I, if I've got under coverage, this is going to be positive. And I'll get a coverage adjustment out of this, just like in post stratification rate. If I don't have under coverage, what is happening implicitly is I'll get a better predictor of why out of this. Because I'm fitting a regression, you know, that's predictive of the why's. And the, the model that's implicit is down here. It's just that Y is a linear combination of those covariates that I'm sticking in my Greg model. So um, it's a linear model too. That's kind of a key thing. And the, this, this mess in the uh, brackets here is just a weight adjustment. So this one over pi is my base weight. This is as if I've not done a non-response adjustment. This could be the um, non-response adjusted weight coming in. And then here's the, the regression adjustment. You know, it's one, if you're right on the money for these estimated totals of the X's, you know, you don't get any adjustment. But if you're off a little, then you, um, you know, it's either up or down on the weights. So, this will, just to repeat, give you coverage correction and it'll reduce variances and it allows a more flexible use of the covariates. Now, the, the trouble with this thing is, you look at this, it's suppose that this T hat is bigger than the pop cap. This thing's negative. You can end up with negative weights, which you know, causes wailing and gnashing of teeth among your users. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you, if you got a weight that's less than one, it's like you're not even man enough to represent yourself. If you're negative, it's like you're, you're worth less than nothing in the sample, and, which uh, seems odd. So there's a way to bound these weights so that doesn't happen. Now, um, calibrate is the function that'll do it. Takes a bunch of parameters. There's um, this CalFun parameter is important because it it basically uh, defines the kind of minimization you're doing to get the weights. So if it's linear, you do the thing that I just showed you, which can produce negative weights. If you use this raking, doesn't mean you're it's the raking estimator. It means there's a certain kind of logarithmic distance function that's getting used. That will guarantee you got positive weights coming out. And uh, on the other hand, it may have a hard time converging. You know, it's iterative. If it's uh, this raking or one of these guys, Logit or Arliss, Brewers, R, R, Z. Um, those have to iterate through some steps to get the weights. You may not converge. You know, I've seen cases that seem perfectly uh, well behaved that won't converge with those distance functions. Sorry, uh, Rick, you said that, that raking is not the raking uh, adjustments, that raking uh, option there on Calvin? And what, what it's doing is it's it's minimizing the distance between the input weights and the output weights, and the distance is defined in different ways for those CalFun values. That's the way I remember it. So I think it's kind of a logarithmic distance. It is the, the same form of the distance 
that the raking algorithm is optimizing okay. if you got a raking problem. Right. But it, it's applied more generally in this case. Yes. Excuse me. Um, how do we think about what the y variable should be for drag versus the x variables? Are these weights specific to a certain survey outcome y rather than a general set of weights that can be used to analyze any outcome? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you look at this formula, this thing in brackets here only has x's in it. Only as covariates. Doesn't have a y in there. So even though I'm implicitly I'm modeling y based on the x's, my weight adjustment here, once you do it, can be used for any y. You know, it, it, you're not explicitly incorporating this b hat into your weights. It's what it amounts. You're incorporating part of it. So you, you, the idea is you can look at more than one Y. You know, you'd like covariates that are good predictors of a bunch of your Ys. Um, once you identify the set of covariates that you think are good, and that can include interactions, then you calculate this, or your software calculates this adjustment, multiply that up by the input weights, and that's it. You got a set of weights that you use for everything. Now, it may not be an equally good predictive model for every Y. So you, you're kind of looking for a, a set of X's that are good for a bunch, pretty good for a bunch of Y's. All right. Um, well, just to go a little farther, this always comes up and people get confused. I mean, could, could I produce a different set of weights for every Y? Yes, with this algorithm. That would occur if the X's that you end up picking as predicting each Y is a little bit different. Then you get a different set of weights. So, you know, what I'm saying is you want a general purpose set of X's, and then you can give users a set of weights and, and uh, say what we always say, which is use these weights for everything. Um, so here's a little example. Let me show you this thing. Uh, this is one of the data sets in the Prac Tools package called uh, the Survey of Mental Health Organizations that SAMHSA let us use. It's uh, in this case, I'm going to predict. Uh, these are basically hospitals. Uh, I'm going to predict total expenditures that a hospital uh, had in a year based on number of beds in the hospital, something <laughs> called scene count, which is the number of patients they saw during the year, and then uh, end of year count, which is like the, the number of people that have ever visited the place, I think, something like that. You know, it's closely related to scene count, but not the same. So I've got a Correlation of 0.7 between beds and expenditure totals. It's not nearly as good for these other two, 0.35 and 0.30. If you look across the first row in the scatter plot matrix, this um, correlation is 0.7, which is mostly due to a kind of a tight relationship down here near the origin. And the um, expenditure total versus scene count looks, you know, weird. Especially this one, it's like this two-part bifurcated model. So what happens is hospital type is pertinent in this. So if I do expenditure count or amount, these are millions of dollars versus beds for different types of hospital, like psychiatric, residential, or veterans, general multi-service substance abuse, then, then it looks better. You know, the scatter plots look a little cleaner. Um, so I probably need to incorporate hospital type in any kind of calibration model. And, and um, before we leave this, 
you know, these, these 0 0.35, 0 0.3 uh, don't look great, but those are actually big enough to get some gains from using them. So, you know, th this doesn't have to be a tight little scatter plot where it's right on a straight line for this to be useful. <clears throat> All right, so I draw a, uh, just for variety, I draw a probability proportional size sample. <coughs> now, size is bids. So th this is only part of the code that's in that examples.zip file that, that you got access to. So th there's a, a function in the sampling package that's called UP Random Systematic. They're not big on short names, the people who wrote this package. What, what that means is you, you sort your file in random order, and then you take a systematic sample, which is kind of like re-randoming, you know, the theory that supports it is if you re-randomize the order of the frame every time you drew a PPS sample, this is sort of what you're aiming toward, but we only do it once. So we, we get this sample, it computes the selection probabilities for us. I save those in this thing called uh, PK. And, uh, and I'm not going to do the details on this. And then I go and I calibrate. So I, uh, I'm going to create a design object here, survey. I create pop totals here, so that I know this is going by way too fast. Um, you know, I, you, you were in this class for a grade, I'd make you go away and do this for homework or something. <laughs> so we, you know, we get the total number of bids in the population, total seam count, total in the year count. So I gotta be able to, to get that from some source. And, um, then I put those in a vector of population counts in a certain order there. And then I use the same calibrate function again. So I, I um, oops, one other thing I should point out. Oh, here. In this x dot bids, I use this thing called a by function. So it's, this says, Take the beds in the population, and, and it's uh, population because SMHO is the population object. And then I get the sum of beds by hospital type. So I'm doing a calibration model where I'm controlling to the number of beds within those four hospital types. Yeah, that's my model. And um, in the calibrate function, you say, here's my formula for this Greg estimator. Scene count plus end of year count plus hospital is a factor, colon bids. So this is our talk for, I'm just doing bids within hospital type. It's not a full, I'm not going to get an implied model where hospital types a main effect in this model. It's just that little um, kind of a cross, but it, it's sums of beds within that type get into the model. And then um, this goes away and calibrates. So calcified and linear means give me this Greg estimator. And then you do the same kind of checks. If I estimate the control totals, do I get zero standard errors, and do I get the control total I fed in? So, you know, if you've goofed up the order of the covariates in this formula versus your pop totals vector, you ought to see that down here. You know, you'll sum up to the wrong thing. You may not get zero standard errors. Um, so you check that. That's the QC part. And then we, we can summarize the weights. So in this case, the um, <coughs> SMHO design was my input probability proportional to size design. So the weights went from 2.7 to 
up to 33.68. And do this calibration in when R was uh, working as it did when we wrote this book, we got a negative weight out of it. You do it again, exactly the same code, you're going to get a, not a negative weight, but a weight that's between zero and one, which is, you know, objectionable for the same reason. So the, the, um, you summarize the weights from this calibrated object, and you got that negative. So suppose we don't like that. You can include a parameter called bound in calibrate. Here it is. So what does this mean? I've got a lower band of point four and upper band of three. That says my ratio of my output calibrated weight to the input weight has got to be bounded by these two things. So this says don't decrease it by any less than 40% or, or more than 40%. And um, I'm not saying that the right way. Um, you know, I'm constricting how little the thing can go. So if the input weight starts positive, uh, the smallest the output weight can get is 40% of the input weight. So it's still going to be positive. And then um, the upper adjustment is no more than three times. So I can triple the weight, that's okay. Now, you know, this, this looks funny. I mean, why not just bound the weights and output weights themselves? It, it's strictly because of the math in deriving the algorithm. That's how DeVille and Sarndahl did it, these two guys. And they did it because it made the math uh, work out for them. There's another way of doing this called quadratic programming that's in our book that uh, would just bound the weights directly. So that, that is doable. <clears throat> All right, so here, here's a picture of uh, what the weights come out to be. So what I've done is down here, I've got the input weights, the PPS weights, and on the y-axis, I've got the output calibrated weights. So if they were all the same, no adjustments, they, they would follow this 45 degree line. And I've graphed unbounded linear means the Greg weights. Unbounded raking uh, means I use that raking distance function with this model. So that's going to guarantee me positive weights. And then bounded linear is the one where I constrict how much the, the Greg weights can uh, change. And, you know, what, what it amounts to is, here's this guy that went negative. In the unbounded raking, it scooches up just a little above zero. It's positive, but not a whole lot positive. And um, in bounded linear, it's slightly larger than that. So it, it you know, the effect is it just sort of, moves it up a little, and it'll adjust other ways to compensate for that. And the, these lines here are just the, the, I'm graphing the weight ratio, so this goes from 3 to 0.4, so after the, the bounding, everything's supposed to scoot up inside this, these bounds, which they do. So, you know, what'll, what can happen with these Greg weights is, It'll leave a lot of them pretty much alone. That's what these are. And it'll monkey with uh, a handful of them in order to hit the control totals. So you, you really need to uh, you know, examine that when, it, when you get the output to make sure that uh, you like the looks of everything. All right. Um, so here's an example, and I what I want to illustrate here is just that um, the effect of these weights can be different depending on your y variable you're estimating. So 
up here, I'm estimating total expenditures. And I, these are the PPS weights. That's what pi estimate is. The pop total is uh, 8.7 million, a billion in maintenance numbers. And the uh, pi estimate's too big by a bit. The, this Greg one with no hospital controls is the one we just looked at. It's got beds within hospitals. And then this is another grid where you, you actually put in hospital type as a main effect. You know, you control to the count of hospitals themselves, not beds, just the count of hospitals. Um, so these are similar in terms of standard error and CV. But if you look at the, if you want to estimate the proportion of hospitals that have financing from the state mental health agency. You know, this, this is a survey of mental health organizations. So they, these are organizations that, that um, you know, treat people for various mental health uh, conditions. If you estimate this thing, the psychiatric hospitals are the ones that tend to get state aid. And that means hospital type is a good predictor of getting state aid. And this Greg 2 down here is the one that includes hospital type. So the, um, you know, the standard error is a lot smaller and CV goes from 16.9 uh, down to 9.9. So you did, you know, much, much better for this one Y variable. Up here, it didn't make much difference on expenditures. So, the, you know, this is a case where you, you know, you look at different Ys and try to get a, a set of covariates that, that works pretty well for everything. <clears throat> Great. Uh, so, Stata will do this. Um, oops. The magic uh, procedure is called SVY Cal, which um, Stata wrote at our request. You know, I was surprised that, that we that much pull. Oh, There's this programmer down at Stata named Jeff Pitblado, who's really good. Man, he I don't know that there's anything he couldn't program if you set it to uh, set him to work on it. So he, you know, we kind of Jill and I spec this out and sent him the specs and. A couple of weeks later, he had a test version of Stata for us to try out, and, which had a, a bug or two that he fixed. And uh, now it's out there. I hope people are using it. All right, so the, these two pieces of code, this will do the unbounded Greg, this will do the bounded Greg. So you, you put both those things in there. Rick? Mm -hmm. uh, the question about the that bounded uh, option, the bounds option in uh, the calibrate function. Uh, assuming that you can get that to converge, uh, would that be any reason why you wouldn't use that bounds option instead of using some sort of trimming if your objective is to try to control the variability of the weights? Yeah, the question is, you know, if you're going to trim weights, why don't you just do this bounding and um, it, it, this is a more formal method of uh, trimming your weights is a way to look at it. So I, you know, I would favor this method over just arbitrary trimming. You know, what, what happens is when you do the arbitrary trimming, like back to the 95th percentile, that'll throw off your control total estimates. So you got to kind of redistribute that weight you trimmed off to everybody else in order to hit the controls, and that's sort of arbitrary. Um, the um, the math behind this is real solid in the sense that you know it goes through, it bounds the weights, it looks at things, hits the control totals by readjusting everything, and it it iterates through so that. Anytime you do something like this, though, the um, theory to back it up, 
basically includes conditions, asymptotic conditions that say uh, the bounding becomes unnecessary in large samples. So it, uh, <laughs> which means that you're just doing unbounded uh, in, in the asymptotic uh, end. So that that means, well, how do you decide that this bound is better? You do a bunch of simulation studies in different circumstances to look at. It. So just a follow up. Um, again, say that you want to uh, decrease the variability of the weights as much as you can. Why wouldn't you just, you know, like keep uh, tweaking these bounds and until you get like I don't know, like the the like the least variability uh, weights you can get uh, at that in a point that is still converted to weights. Yeah, I mean you could. Um set up a kind of a math programming problem that would say, I want to bound the weights, I want to hit the control totals, and I want to control the uh, variation, coefficient of variation of the weights overall, all at the same time. And um, that that's a solvable problem. In fact, we did that on HRS, essentially, to figure out you know, we had a, a situation where we had these commercial lists and they gave us information that we could use to classify in advance households as being white only, Hispanic only, that kind of thing. It, it, classifications had some error though. So we had from the previous round of uh, maybe family growth, we could make a two-way table of how does the commercial list classification compare to the real classification? So we, you know, we had those accuracy rates. And uh, the math programming problem was get an initial sample allocation that hit the desired uh, number of respondents of different race ethnicities accounting for anticipated non-response subject to a band on the weight variation and um, I forget if there was a uh, another bound or two in there but it, it's um, it, you know we did it with this thing called solver in Excel but SAS has got math programming algorithms like OptModel is one and PROC NLP is another it'll do the same thing So you're, you know, in these problems that you can't get a um, clean analytic solution to, math programming is a good way to go, I think. You know, I've always liked it. Okay, so that's that. And speaking of variation in weights, I think I'll just plow ahead with not another break. You guys have broken down enough already. Mm -hmm.